Hello. Hello. Welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? First Things Foundation presents this, I don't know, inquiry on philosophy and theology and old world, new world stuff based on our work in the field. My name's John. Today I'm sporting a, my New York Mets hat, so kindly donated by my children. My children invited me to a Mets game recently as part of Father's Day, uh, Names Day, Birthday. They combined it because these days Major League Baseball will will take all of your money. And they put all of their money in a pot and got me to go to New York to watch the Mets with them. Four daughters. Three of them knew that strikes happened at a bowling alley. <laughs> One of them was my youngest. She was like, yeah, oh, look at that, inside pitch. But I, I'm not sure she knew she was talking about baseball. I think she was like, maybe it. That had something to do with, I don't know, knowing something about the interwebs that no one else knows, like an inside pitch. I loved them, though. That was kind. Don't you guys think? It felt like a big wig. If you're not, if you're listening to this and you want me to stop talking, I don't blame you. This is Heavy Things Done Lightly on behalf of First Things Foundation. Uh, This is episode 100 and a billion. No, it's like 100 and some. And this episode is called, Do You Believe in the Bible? Do you believe in the Bible? You can ask that with about a thousand inflections if you think about it. Do you believe in the Bible? Do you believe in the Bible? But I think it's mostly asked this way. Do you believe in the Bible? Like it's, it's, it's sort of aggressive. Do you believe in the Bible? And so I thought about that as a phrase that's really, really resonant and relevant in modern America because so many people say it in that way, either, do you believe in the Bible? Like, really? Or do you even believe in the Bible? And then you start thinking about the phrase, and what does it mean? Like, do you know people that say this? I know you do. But what exactly are they saying? Do you believe in the words of the Bible? I think that's the thing to be believed in, right? I I think so. I mean, you believe what it says? The problem is it says, oh, goodness. It says a lot. Like, maybe they're trying to say, do you believe in Jesus? Do I believe in the word of God? Hmm. But I think most people are saying, do you believe in the words? Like the same way as we say, do you believe in the words of the Quran? Or do you believe in the words of Kamala? Or do you believe in Donald's words? There's a conflation going on. And I thought I would take it apart today. A water. Andrew, in Russia, do you believe in the Bible? Russians don't, I don't think. Maybe we'll get into that right now. But do you believe there was an assassination? An assassination? A shmormorsination? An assassination? There was an assassination attempt. It wasn't even an attempt. It happened. The daughter of... Alexander Dugan was killed, but I have a feeling they meant to kill Alex. If that's in your world, that is quite a story that could lead to other stories and other experiences by all of us that maybe we don't want to have. If you don't know what I'm talking about, let's move on. Do you believe in the Bible? First of all, I think you got to look at this concept of books. Books are interesting things. Mostly, we don't have them in history. At least, not regular old people. We don't really have them because there weren't many of them. Like, very few. And so, there's an implication in all of that. And that's that books are special in history. Old world history, especially. For most humans, in most epochs, 
yeah, all the way back to all the old world, books hold a special place in history. And in them are special ideas because there are so few. And then we printed like 129,864,888 of them. We printed 130 million books since the printing press, since the 1500s. That's how many titles have been printed. So that's not how many books. That's just how many titles. So it's how many books times 100, how many titles, how many books times 120. It's just hundreds of, it's just trillions, it's billions. And so books aren't so special anymore. So it's weird to say, do you believe in the Bible as a book? Because books are everywhere. The Bible has lost its uniqueness. Um, and that makes the words, do you believe in the Bible, even more difficult. But that's like a little historical, a little foray into historical reality. Right? So they don't mean... Do you believe in the Bible as in, do you believe in the sanctity of a book? They mean, do you believe in what it says? But that's not easy to understand. Here's what I mean. The Bible is an old world book. And so it's not saying a thing. It's, well... It's doing a pre-enlightenment thing. Now, if you're saying right now, and I know somebody is saying this, look, you're saying that book is bigger than your old world, new world, dumb divide, dude. Yeah, if you're saying the Bible encompasses all things, it is not an old world, new world conversation, and you're like pissed. Maybe you like threw down... I don't know, you threw down like a taco on the ground. If you're that person out there, you're right. But what I'm trying to say is that the bigger part, the Bible as bigger than that, than bigger than the new world or bigger than the old world, I want to say that it's bigger, taller, wider than all of that, but... It's those things because of a reason I don't think you would agree with. And that's because the Bible is logos. The Bible is word, but the real word, the word we are meant to know is Christ, not the Bible. See, words are logos, meaning, seeds of meaning. They are not meant to convey like an idea in particular or image in particular. They aren't conveyor belts. They aren't things in that sense. They denote meaning, sure, but the meaning is found in reality. The meaning is not found in the word. It's not found in the book. Reality is what the little scratched out ink blots are trying to lead you toward. They're trying to envelop you with a reality, a, 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 a table as reality, a human as reality. You're meant to exist in reality, and reality is where we find God. So for a Christian, reality is God which is Christ, which is the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, all that stuff. So Logos is Christ, and we find him in all things, not just the Bible. In some ways, like, do you believe in the church is the same question as do you believe in the Bible, which is a similar question. Do you believe in the icon, which is a similar question. Do you believe in the priesthood? Do you... Oh, oh, there's a lot of stuff all of a sudden. And you could even say, do you believe in the grass as an emblem or an icon of growth, which of course is a type of reality that we're all experiencing. 
you can go a little way down the rabbit hole, which we should. And that kind of, well, that kind of thing brings me back to this old world, new world thing that you may have spiked your taco about. The Bible is an old world book. So let's just look at that for a second. It comes out of a way of thinking, out of a way of being. It emerges from a religion, from a particular way of being bound. Religion here, of course, being ligament, that, that the, the concept of religion is binding, same root as the word, right, ligament, which is principles that bind together a worldview. The Bible is coming out of a worldview or an experience of the world. It's coming out of a certain worldview that I'm calling old world here, but it, it, it's a Christian worldview, and in particular, an Orthodox Christian worldview, in my humble opinion. So, in that sense, it cannot be believed in a Bible. It can't be believed in as if it was a proposition. It can't be assented to. That's not how old world books work. And the old world books work a lot like love. Like love works in a marriage, for example. The Bible is what comes out of God's love for mankind. Just like love between man and woman is the product or the outcome of marriage and not the other way around. You don't get married because you're in love. Well, not in the old world anyway. Again, marriage has an old world flavor in this particular podcast because I just want to like remind you of it. Now, you could argue that's not what marriage is. That's fine. I'm trying to do a old world, like a, an old world reflection. Like an old world, it's sort of like, uh, like an old world review, and then you can do whatever you want with it. You can take the review and this thing and chuck it out the window. But what I'm trying to say is, you see, in the old world, marriage is a, is a thing sacrament much like the bible and so you got to realize that the sacrament produces the thing sacrament is the producer of the magic of the mystery the bible is a producer it's not a thing that you believe in as a proposition again take a look at love you don't marry in the old world for love you marry because you want love as the outcome of your commitment Hmm. Right? And so what's happening is, is you get the thing, love, when you enter and make the commitment, marriage. You get the thing, the Bible, when you enter and make the commitment to, uh-oh, here it goes, the church. And that entree, that entranceway is through baptism. And there is the beef, of course, in history, if you know your Protestant Reformation. I'm not going to go down the Protestant Reformation rabbit hole. I am going to go down the Muslim rabbit hole today. Ah, curveball. You'll see why. Anyway, I know this because I did some research, you know, on the interwebs, but also a lot of research in my past life before this First Thing Foundation gig, which I love. Please look us up, www.first-things.org. When you look at the baptismal rites, of the initiation into access to the Bible, if you look at those rites in the earliest books, the earliest books that the, that the church is using, the Didache, right, the, the teaching of the 12 apostles, some of the, the gospels that aren't in the canon, if you look at the earliest catechisms, in those catechisms you see that there's all these admonitions about Christian life, there's, there's, there's conversations about what a prayer looks like, what an orphan is, and how to treat them, what a martyr is, what bishops are, how to conduct yourself when bishops are around, how to give alms. There's all these rules, liturgical rules too, about where to stand in a church, how to fast, when to fast, how to live, man, how to educate, how to be a good teacher, how to be a bad... These early documents are the things that catechumens, newly interested, uh, Christo-curious Christo people, 
ortho curious people. If you were, if it was 150 AD, 150 years after Christ, and you were Christo curious, then what happened is, is you had access to all this stuff, mostly through the oral tradition, but also in actual writings. And the, not the Bible. First of all, the Bible was just being formed up in its canonical form. My point is, is you wouldn't even get to the Bible yet in the early Christian life. You would get all of these catechesis, all of these documents to get you to the Bible, to get you to the icons, to get you to communion, to get you to the Holy Supper, the Agape Feast, to get you to communion. And they weren't, they were extracted from all kinds of things, quote, in the Bible, but they were also extracted from church tradition. They were extracted from the lives of the martyrs. They were extracted from a ton of things. And they were accessible to you if you were new. But not the Bible. Not so much. You might get a few readings here and there in the early days, the first 300 years. But mostly what you got was the catechesis. And that's what you can still get. And if you listen and you go to an Orthodox church sometime, you'll also hear people say, catechumens depart, catechumens depart. In other words, if you're ortho-curious, now's the time for you to leave. And it's pretty early. It's not late. It's not very late in that two and a half hour gig. It's early because you don't get access to most stuff. Now, you, you will get access to the, to the epistle it, as it's performed now in the liturgy. The point is, though, is you don't get access to everything. And that everything comes after you get married. Right? Here's an easy way to think of it. I'll just tell a story. Let's call it the Smith family. If you're a Smith out there, sorry, everyone picks on you, but I'm doing it too. The Smith family. I don't know. Let's say the Smith family of, oh, I don't know. Let's go with. Atlanta, Georgia. The Smith family of Atlanta, Georgia has been getting together for 20 years. You know what they've been doing? This really cool thing where they remember their uncle who started, I don't know, let's make it a brewery. I'm literally making this up as we go. And the brewery is an amazing thing. What a, what a delicious ale they've concocted, the Smith family ale. And in making that, there was this one really precious moment where, I don't know, the uncle was given a puppy and the puppy wandered into the beer and it, it, you know what it did? It actually, it survived. It didn't die inside the beer vat. And it actually, for some reason, made the vat taste delicious. And they called that brew the puppy brew. And the puppy was a very interesting gray puppy, a gray Great Dane. You still following me? Anyway, long story short, that's the little story the Smith tells every year at this at this get together called the puppy the puppy uh, I don't know reunion, and then one day the Smith family invites I don't know you. And your name is Bill or whatever your name is, and you decide you're going to go to the Smith Puppy Brew reunion, and you go and man, what a great time! There's little buttons commemorating the puppy of three generations before, and there's. There's like really cool stuff happening at the Puppy Brew con uh, reunion that you're just, re and you love all the Smiths and they're your buddy. And that's how you got invited because they're your friends. And you go there and you sit down and you realize, man, this is awesome. And you take away after your little puppy, your little puppy reunion day, you take away one of their little pamphlets about Puppy Brew and the story of it. And you take it and you write a whole, I don't know, a diary, a diary uh, entry about that. And then at the end of the diary entry, you say, this would make a great blog. And then you blog it. And then what happens is people love your blog. And I don't even know why, because it sounds boring. But they love your blog and they reproduce your blog and they love that blog so much. And they learn so much about the Puppy Brew Smith family reunion. Except you got a couple things wrong. But here's the thing. It wasn't a gray puppy you wrote about it was a black puppy. And the black puppy wasn't a puppy. It was a full-grown Great Dane. Because that's the way you remember it. But you got it wrong. Or did you? Because definitely one of the people at the reunion told you it was a black puppy. Here's my point. Eventually, your blog becomes a part of reality. Or at least some people's reality. 
There's no way at this point to really determine carefully exactly what's happening. Oh, wait, I'm wrong. There is a way, and there's only one way. For you and everyone else who now believes that the puppy brew was a full-blown Black Great Dane, it's for you to go back to the Smith family and spend a day or a month or a year and actually enter into the Smith family reality. And within that reality, you will imbibe all that you need to know about your retelling of their excellent puppy reunion. You'll also imbibe the whole mojo of the Smiths. And what if you actually fell in love with the Smith and you married one of the Smiths and then you went there on the regular? You would begin to tell the story as the Smith family tells the story. And eventually you would just stick to the Smith family reading of the puppy brew story. Yours would be obsolete. At least the one you wrote outside, out there, far away from the Smith family abode. And here's the point. Is the Bible, the Smith family puppy story, belongs to the Smiths. And in order to fully understand the Smith family puppy story, you need to be, on some level, a Smith. Either an adopted member or you marry in. That's how truth is known. And the Bible is telling a truth, but you only get it. You only get access to it if you enter the family. Now, if you're thoroughly pissed off right now, that's fine. If you're, I don't know, willowing willowing up the word arrogant, I get it. That's the way things were known And that's why you don't believe in the Bible. You believe in that which bore it, which is Christ. And that's a different way to understand stuff. And if you don't understand it that way, that's fine. If you understand it maybe as wholly given, typed up and dropped off by God, then you are probably closer to being Muslim than to being Christian, because that is how Islam understands the Quran. Before we get into that, let's take a break. Andrew, swipe. Guys, this is John from First Things asking you to do one thing. Go to our website, www.first-things.org, or just type in First Things Foundation or type in, why are we talking about rabbits? Or type in KP restaurant, or type in something. It'll lead you to our website where I want you to donate. I want you to donate money. Because when you do, our field workers eat, and when they eat, they continue to facilitate marvelous, lovely, wonderful local projects. www.first-things.org Help folks trying to help themselves. And in the meantime, help folks who will help others because of their love for their own projects. And we do this in America and we do it overseas. Check us out. Become a recurring donor. Thank you. And let's continue. All right. So I've made a claim. That's not a claim. That's one of the problems with my brain. It works like it's claim-oriented. I would like to not be claim-oriented. I would rather be relationship-oriented. So here's something happening that I know that it's, it's happening to me in my heart, which is I've grown to love many Muslims around the world, but I don't understand the Quran and it's the way it's understood and plop down in the world. So the Quran is different from the Bible because in Islamic tradition, it dropped literally almost from the sky. It came from God through the ear of Muhammad. It came complete and whole as an artifact of heaven, mediated through the final prophet Muhammad. The Quran is Islam in that way. 
Now, they've gone on to translate it in other languages, but whew, there's a huge fight in Islam about that. It's supposed to stay in Arabic. That's the proper way to understand it. Because why? That's the language chosen by God. So, the Quran allows for one to know how to live, how to speak, how to obey, how to pray. In this way, the Quran is not really like the Bible. It's a manual for living. And that's why... The Quran is a very, very, very new world document. And you'll hear Muslims say this. Many Muslims preach that the Quran is a rational testament. It's God's rational invite to mankind. I'm telling you, check it out. It's a practical book. All their theology is practical. It's like, I don't know. Muslims will go to, God, will go, go to heaven because they believe in the Quran. Right? And that's why wherever you see Islam and wherever you see the Quran becoming a part of the culture, you always see Sharia law. Because Sharia accompanies the Quran because the Quran is laying out how reality should look. Reality here being your life in the world. So Sharia always travels with the Quran. Wherever Islamic teachers and Islamic people go, Sharia comes with it. Sharia law is just what happens when one reads and obeys the Quran. And that is not a good or bad thing. I, that's not what we're doing. Now, we could argue about it. It's not relevant to this podcast. I'm trying to show you that the Quran is practical. It's stripped of many of these layers of weird, iconic reality. Now, the Sufis within Islam are going to recover a lot of the mystery and teach the mystery. And so in a lot of ways, I'm not being fair. But to the fundamental foundations of Islam, and you'll see in a second what I mean. Yeah, the Quran is a practical document. But it's not like the Bible. It's also not like the Maharabata or the, the, the Vedic traditions in Hinduism. It's, it's not like the Bhagavad Gita. It's not like a Buddhist text. And it's not like the Bible. No, the Bible for ancient Christians was what members of the family read to tell them about the family they had already joined. It was the revelation of the one with whom they'd already been united. It was like a key. Like a wine key. See what I did there? To an incredible passageway into a labyrinth of meaning a labyrinth so deep that the words in the book itself could never and would never and may never and shall never be exhausted. But all the passageways need a guide. The modern world says that guide is your heart. That would imply your heart is pure. Perhaps. <laughs> Maybe you're the one. But the passageways need a guide, and the guide has been and was known to early Christians as the church, the body of believers sharing in the journey. It's the kind of mystical engagement that, well, you see it all across the world, all across the old world. But I would say that the Quran and really Islam as a religion is much more new world than old. The Quran and the earliest Islamic philosophers and the theologians, all of them are doing something very new world with their book. They are treating it as a proposition, as a set of beliefs to adhere to. And if you look at history, and you should, you'll see that Islamic theologians were often also cutting-edge scientists. Almost always, they were the cutting-edge scientists of their time. And what is their time? It's that period between the, the Muslim invasion of North Africa and, and much of Byzantine East. So you're talking about early 600s right up until about the 1200s. But especially 700 to about 900. So if you look at history, you'll see that the Muslim theologians, the greatest of the Muslim theologians, were also the greatest of our world's scientists. Right? And so they started to look at creation practically. 
And if you look at history, you'll see that those same theologians offered back to Western Christians a dominant philosophical format, a way of seeing the world. And that format was Aristotelian, was essentially Aristotle turned into Islamic theology. Right? It's a study of the whole world through the study of its propositional parts. If you don't know who Thomas Aquinas is, look him up. He's a Catholic, Catholic Western saint. And he's doing what the Muslims do with Islamic theology, but he's doing it with Christian stuff in the 1200s, right on the heels of them doing their own, quote, enlightenment. Look at some of these dudes from Muslim history. Ibn Sina. Well, 1000 AD, he's living, right? 200 years before Aquinas, commonly known in the West as Avicenna, was a Persian polymath who was regarded as one of the most significant physicians and philosophers and writers of the Islamic Golden Age. Avicenna, Avicenna, as it's pronounced, right, is trying to reconcile the rational world with the world of the Quran. And this was 600 years before the European Enlightenment. Al-Kindi is a rational philosopher, prolific writer. Al-Kindi, his whole concern was to show the compatibility of Aristotelian philosophy with speculative Muslim theology. Ali ibn Sahi Rabban. He was a psychiatrist before there was any such thing. He was a clinical psychologist before there was any such thing. Al-Farabi, he's a social psychologist, and he comes up with the whole concept in Islamic theology of consciousness. Al-Sagani, he's a historian. And check this out. This is amazing. Telling the story, the history, the history of science. Yeah. He's living in the 900s, right? So, I mean, there's another. Al-Gahani is the theologian and pioneer of neosurgery. So, what do I think about all this? I think if you look carefully and see clearly that these are theologians doing science and without so much as a blink of an eye, they're doing it as Muslim wise men. In fact, they are the Muslim wise men. They are the foundational thinkers of the theology behind all of Islam. They are the Islamic holy fathers. And as the earliest formulators of Muslim theology, right, they're also the most important scientists of the time. And for them, <laughs> that stuff goes together, man. It goes together. In this way, Islam never needed an enlightenment. And in that way, they never had one. But they did give one to Western Christians. And they could give an enlightenment or the seeds of such a thing because they knew their book as a proposition offered by God to the new world, to the whole world. Hmm. That's, that's just not what the Bible is. It's not a proposition. It's simply the revelation of, of Christ. It's just the revealing of Christ, known to the initiates. What? What? I could be wrong. That is up for you to decide. <laughs> anyway, I, I, the whole point is to become the Bible. It's to become like that which is Christic. It, you, can't, you can believe in it. It's weird, though. Like, Do you believe in the icon? I believe in icons. No, no, no. You worship God by, right, 
venerating an icon. You don't believe in it, though. It's an odd phrase. It's a very, very odd phrase, a very new world phrase. Something I hope to talk to people about as I interview. There's some cool interviews coming up, including with Jonathan Pajot and Paul Vanderclay and some others. I'm going to put this to them because I do think there is a, a really mismatched um, reality in choosing the word believe when trying to understand the Bible. But I could be wrong. I mean, otherwise, you, well, let's just put it this way. God became man so that man could become like God. Whoa. The deep mystery of that. Do I then turn around and say, I believe in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, you can say it, but it's so much different than that. And I think understanding the old world understanding of the Bible is very helpful. Very, very helpful. All right. Andrew, we love you out in Russia. We hope you're doing good. I hope you have a great day, all of you, wherever you are. Continue to support First Things. It is masterful, our little organization, uh, the group of supporters that have congregated around it. Thank you guys for being a part of this. Lots popping. I hope you'll want to come to Georgia with us. If you hear this and you're still time in your world, join us. We have seats four exactly at this moment to go to the Georgian Republic on September 16th. We'll stay there for 10 days. If you'd like to do that, get a hold of us through the website or write me at johnhears at first-things.org. If you don't want to do that, Come to our restaurant in Greenville. We're also going to have weekend visits where you come for the weekend, go up and see our guys in North Carolina, talk about cool projects, and then spend time at the at the restaurant. And we'll even participate in some local philosophy and history. And we'll have a great time together for two nights on a weekend in Appalachia. That's coming up. Join our pod course. When you become a recurring donor, you are a part of the pod course. All this is happening and other things. And, of course, our rush, our final four-month rush to raise the funds we need to support our field workers and continue to facilitate amazing projects, 16 of them now, around the world. Much love. Peace to you. Have a great, great summer afternoon. Nakwamdis, from Watar.